Welcome everybody to, as I announced before, the very last uh, speaker, not just of this semester, but for the entire Templeton project of the three years. Very happy to have Lena Janssen here from uh, Nottingham University. Lena did her undergraduate studies at Oxford and then went to the US, to the University of Michigan, to do a PhD there under the supervision of Larry Sklar. Mm -hmm. Uh, after that, she had a job at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, before she moved, I think, two years ago or so yeah, to Nottingham, two and a half, yeah. two and a half yeah. to, to Nottingham, the University of Nottingham, where she's an assistant professor now. She works on history and philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, metaphysics, and one theme that seemed to seems to to, to uh, sort of uh, tie many of these different areas together is explanation in your work. Yeah. She also has many prizes, too many that I'm not going to list them. She has several publications in the world's very best journals, BJPS, Philosophy of Science, Studies, Academies, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm, I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and I'm just going to announce the title of today's talk. So, so Lina will be talking about, is time like space when it comes to explanatory directionality? Please, Lina. Thank you. So uh, thank you for that. I feel um, very happy to be here to have made the very last talk and also feeling that um, pressure of hopefully saying something interesting for the very last session. Um, now, to start off with, um, uh, I am going to be talking about whether time is like space when it comes to explanatory directionality, but it's somewhat a rhetorical question because I think the answer is no, <laughs> and then we're going to say something about why and what that might mean. So, to get going, the first thing that I uh, wanted to say a little, little bit about is why we might worry about explanation um, at all. So in much of the discussion that I will be engaging with, worries about explanation aren't explicitly at the forefront, uh, but I think that you get to them quite quickly once you start following the line of reasoning, so I want to say a little bit about why I think we should be worried about explanation in this context. So. Before starting to make the argument in a bit more detail, um, I wanted to uh, just start by noticing that in the context of trying to figure out what we might demand in terms of recovering a notion, temporal notions or spatio-temporal notions uh, when we don't take them to be fundamental. Uh, you get claims such as this one from uh, Rovelli that I think is going to appear in your volume actually. I think that's my default coming in the volume. Okay. Um, where um, Ravella distinguishes three different notions of time. Uh, one to do with relational time, a sort of location between different um, events and processes, um, which he takes to be relevant to fundamental physics. Uh, one that has to do with irreversible time, which he connects both to notions of causality uh, and notions of irreversible processes, which he thinks is not directly relevant to the fundamental physics that he's concerned with. Uh, and experiential time, the sense of time flowing, as philosophers often say, uh, or the experience that we have of a seemingly um, anticipating the future but remembering the past those kinds of experiential notions of time. Uh, and the latter two are taken to have no direct bearing on fundamental physics. And what I'm going to try to do today is to try to give an argument that um, the latter two notions can be brought in to have a bearing more than you might initially have thought. But it's going to be a little bit of a roundabout way of doing it, so I wanted to put it up straight away that this is where it's going, so that you will bear with me for the rest of the talk to get a sense of why I might think this. Um, and to foreshadow a little bit about what's going to come up quite soon, um, the worry that I think uh, this way of distinguishing different notions of time um, raises is that insofar, the, insofar that we're interested in uh, realists' takes on fundamental physics, 
Uh, as soon as we start making realist arguments that make use of explanationist strategies, which many of them do, so plenty of realist arguments that use either arguments from explanatory indispensability or some style of inference to the best explanation for why we should take our fundamental physical theories to also be some guide to what reality is like. Um, we seem to make use of notions of explanation that, at least at the first pass, seem like they are tracking the latter two notions above. And I'm going to try to spell out a bit more why I think that those notions of explanation uh, and come to matter. Um, now, this connection to arguments from realism is one that I think we see uh, with some frequency uh, within these writings. Um, in particular when it comes to uh, challenges for uh, theories that do not take uh, space-time to be fundamental, to be emergent in some sense. So here is a, a recent paper um, by people involved in this project, so it seemed particularly appropriate to have this here. Um, and for, for my purposes, what I'm really interested in here is that it's an argument that's considering um, whether or not we have a, if we have a theory, whether it's a non-spatial temporal region, does that invite um, empirical incoherence, um, at least regarding that portion of the universe described by that? Uh, and the answer is no, for of course observations are possible in the spatial temporal region, so the theory is capable of empirical support by its own lights, and insofar as it is supported, so are its consequences including the existence of the non spatiotemporal region. Now, even though it's not explicitly spelled out here, I think that this draws on kind of general realist intuitions for how we should take our theories to extend beyond the observable. And we also have a notice here that there are quite strong realist um, intuitions. You need to extend it to beyond the kind of standard worries that an anti-realist might have raised because there are some specific interesting features. First, the non-spatiotemporal phase is unobservable in a particularly profound sense, uh, more profoundly than a very small object, say. So here, what I think we see is that we have an inference here that makes use of inference even to the not observable portions of the theory, and they're, not, they're unobservable in a way that would raise the stronger sense than what would raise concerns for just, you know, Van Frassen and style and realist worries. Um, so, even though the way that I'm setting it up I think is fairly non-standard, I think these concerns about realism or anti-realism and what is legitimate to infer from the observation surface quite quickly in the discussions. All right. So, now, let me say a little bit about why I think that explanatory directionality matters here. Now, the observation that we can make about temporal directionality and explanatory directionality is that there is a feature here that's explained in quite a common way in the explanation literature. Um, and that explanation, I think, is not very friendly to carry over to theories where um, spatiotemporal features um, are emergent in some sense not fundamental. So I'll say why. So here's the observation. Typically, maybe always, that's going to be contentious, but at least typically, uh, the present state of the system might be able to explain the future state, but the present state cannot explain the past state. You might be able to infer the past state from the present state, but you're not explaining it. On the other hand, the present state might be, might be able to be explained by the past state, but it's not explained by the future state. So the kind of slogan that I have in mind here is one that you sometimes see asserted with various strengths of caveats, whether it's typically or whether it's just said that retrodictions are not explanatory. Some predictions are, but not all of them. Trying to capture the similar intuition that there's something about explanatory directionality and temporal directionality that seems like it tends to align. Um, we seem to get the direction of explanation running alongside uh, a temporal directionality, 
and there's no such restrictions from spatial directionality. So there's no kind of even typical features to point out about what can explain what in terms of spatial directionality. Uh, but there seems as if though there are in the temporal case. Now, what would the literature in philosophy of science sort of standardly say about the directionality of explanation and why there tends to be a length? Do you want to do questions as we? I, I'm not sure what's that. If you want to, yeah. Okay. Um, what do we mean by spatial directionality exactly? Spatial yep. orientation. Okay. Yeah. So a privileged orientation in space. That's the idea of that in mind. So there seems to be this idea that there's a Something interesting privileged about the direction of explanations, if you think that some predictions, but not all, are explanatory, but no, or at least almost no, retrodictions are, um, that doesn't seem to have an analog in the spatial case. It's no kind of privileged direction in space along which explanations run, but not vice versa. Um, and here's what standard accounts in the philosophy of science would say about this. Um, let's say something like this. Direction of explanation is identified with the direction of causation. Causes are, here we have different strengths of how strongly you want to say this, causes are typically temporally prior to their effects, so you'd expect the explanatory direction to typically run from um, past to the present, present to the future, and so on. That's a kind of fairly standard thing to say. Um, and depending on your theory of causation, um, one of the standard things to say is to take the relata of the causal relation to be events, in which case the spatial temporal nature is built in also to the relata, because the relata themselves are supposed to be spatial temporally uh, located in the causal relation. So, that's a thing we might say to explain the seeming difference in a fairly standard causal account of explanation that there's a um, explanatory directionality it tends to align with temporal directionality because that tracks the directionality of causation. Causation has a privileged temporal directionality but no privileged spatial directionality. That's why we don't see the equivalent. That's a standard thing to say. Now, let me say a little bit about why I think that this story is going to raise some difficulties for at least realist arguments that want to rely on some type of explanatory inferences in the background for us to support their realism. Um, which uh, I should also say I take to be one of the main arguments for scientific realism, some form of either explanatory indispensability or no miracles intuition um, in the running in the background here. So let me say a little bit about why this seems like it could become um, problematic. So here what I have is a little passage um, about uh, what we might take to happen in uh, canonical approaches to uh, quantum gravity. So it's hard to state this in a way that um, is at all precise without giving you the full, the full article. Uh, but all that I really want from the purposes of this talk, is really formulated, really uh, spelled out here, um, is that if we take it to be the case that we have theories where there cannot be any change over time, fundamentally speaking. So maybe there can be change over time, maybe there's change in the world, but there's no change over time fundamentally. Uh, we seem as if though we have done something to our accounts of explanation that we are going to have to do some work to capture. So before I can spell that out a little bit more, I need to provide one caveat. So I know that depending on what you think we ought to do about this situation, uh, you might be less or more worried about what I'm about to say. So, using the kind of responses that you might take to this issue, um, you might think that what you should do is 
to go on with the intuition that started off the explanatory discussion and treat time and space uh, really differently. Um, and the sort of different ways you could do that. Uh, you could go opt for a radical elimination of time, um, or you could opt for a postulation of time as fundamental. Now, those would be ways to really treat space and time uh, really differently, mirroring the kind of different roles they play in explanation. Uh, but you might not want to do that. Uh, you might want to do something that rather is going to be my main focus for this talk, which is treating space and time together as emerging from some non spatiotemporal fundamental ontology, in which case it now looks like we're owed more of an answer for why space and time are playing such different roles when it comes to our explanatory practices. Um, here we've kind of written space and time as having different roles from the start. I actually think that this is going to be problematic here too. Taking time as fundamental issues going to then want to talk about systems to dissolve. Um, but this is going to be what I'm going to find most interesting how to try to get. Um, a story where you treat time and space and time together um, as emerging from a non spatiotemporal fundamental ontology and yet not destroy the realist inferences, or at least not weaken them. So, now we get to one of the um, main worries that I want to push for this talk. So, here's the first worry. Uh, once we moved to a physics where the spatiotemporal is supposed to emerge, in whatever sense that means, uh, from the non spatiotemporal fundamental level, and we're not supposed to have these notions at the fundamental level, uh, it looks like the standard story about scientific explanation um, is just no good anymore. So the standard story I've just given. Uh, about what it amounts to have explanatory directionality in terms of having causal directionality um, doesn't look like it gets any traction um, anymore, at least on standard accounts of causation that try to say that causation is a directive notion in space and time. <laughs> uh, might even have spatiotemporal velata. This looks like it's not going to get us uh, very far towards understanding the explanatory relations within the fundamental theory that doesn't have space or spatiotemporal fundamental features. And this, I think, is going to be particularly problematic because we can give several different arguments uh, from the idea that we can describe some piece of theory and try to identify it with an emergent feature, such as a temporal feature or a spatial feature. But to then make the move from that to ontology, uh, we typically do so via some realist route or other. Um, and many of these realist routes involve arguments that crucially rely on our ontological commitment to what's doing explanatory work in some way or other. And these arguments gain their force largely by pointing to familiar arguments of explanation where we have sort of good sense of what's going on, and saying that here we are totally willing to argue via, say, inference the best explanation, or we're willing to recognize uh, ontological commitment from um, uh, the indispensable role within an explanation that we accept that some entity or structure plays. Now, this looks like it's going to be Ah, uh, yes. So this is just a quick quote to show that I'm um, uh, not completely making this worry up. So this is a worry that I think in different contexts, in quite different forms, have already been raised in the literature. Uh, the concern about how we get um, from a mathematical description or identif identif identification of some structure within a model to a claim that this concerns ontology. Um, and uh, one of the concerns that come up here are ones that have to do exactly with how to understand the emergence relation. Uh, and a tempting thing to do would be to understand it as largely an explanatory one, but it's not causal explanatory. We need to say something else about it. So this is objecting to a causal reading. 
All right. Um, right. So the way that it's put here is um, that as things stand, the supposed emergence concerns only descriptions, but not ontology. Uh, it remains unclear how to transform this move in one's mathematical descriptions into a cogent ontology of the physical domain, according to which space-time is not fundamental, but emerges from some entities outside space-time. Uh, I take that to be asking exactly for an explanatory story where we have made a realist move to take us to commit to an ontology and give us an account of how we then get uh, emergent spatio-temporal features from that fundamental ontology. Now, I think that this leads to a new problem. So uh, I'm calling it a new problem of empirical incoherence, uh, largely because I thought of it when I read about the problem of empirical incoherence. Uh, and it has connections to it, but it has slightly different flavors. I'll explain what it is. Now, the worry that I think we should have at this stage is that if our fundamental physical theories uh, are accepted as physically salient, so we made this move from just description to ontology, uh, based on some standard realist arguments that we develop via explanationist lines, uh, by extrapolating from a context where explanatory directionality comes apart from, apart from predictive retrodictive directionality through a causal temporal directionality, so the causal notions that are, have uh, temporal components to them, um, we get a version of a self-undermining concern. Uh, we get a version of a self-undermining concern because we're now not undermining the existence of um, uh, observables, of the observations, empirical observations, the local, if you want, variables that we're using as evidence for our theory. What we now have a concern for is that we're undermining the basis of the inference that we're making from those observations to a realist understanding of the theory. Um, and why are we undermining that inference? Well, because we're making that inference uh, on regular realist explanationist grounds that we get to by pointing to familiar explanatory commitments and claiming that these hold in these contexts as well. But if the familiar expl explanatory commitments are based on causal understandings of directionality that align with temporal directionality, um, we have now removed the basis for the understanding of explanation that we relied upon in convincing ourselves to be realist in the first place. So it's not a challenge to the observational base that we might use, it's a challenge to the inferences that we can legitimately make from that observational base. Um, which is why I call it a new problem of empirical incoherence. So it only really arises insofar as you have realist submissions in an explanationist vein. Uh, but as I hope I've at least made you tempted to believe from the earlier slides, um, having those realist arguments, I think it's quite common wanting to ex extend commitment to the theory in realist ways, even while recognizing that we then have to except some realist argument or other to extend this into even the unobservable, perhaps even very strongly unobservable portions of the theory, uh, I think we're going to face well, some worries of these kinds. So that is part of the um, bad news. So. Um, in a way, what I'm trying to answer, I think, is arguing uh, against um, the idea that the problems for the problems for making the inference is one that's shared for scientific realists equally independently across your theories. Uh, and here again, my hosts arguing this time against Maudlin's concerns in these these veins um, by saying that. Uh, the problem is really one of scientific realism. Uh, do we have adequate evidence for the entities or not? And the question is really whether there would be a special reason for doubting the truth of theory sans space-time at stake, so whether not having um, space-time fundamental level, uh, given empirical evidence. And here what I have tried to do is to try to convince you that there is a potential of self-undermining concern when we drop spatiotemporal features and that we don't have 
uh, for theories where we keep those features. So I do think that uh, there is a fair uh, charge to push that physical, uh, fundamental physical theories um, that lack spatial-temporal structure has a particular challenge insofar as they want to make this realist argument uh, that other theories would not face. I mean, they might have other problems, but that is not the, it's not the issue. All right, so, so far, I have now, I think, reached the end of what I take to be the bad news portion of the talk. So I'm now going to try to make a positive suggestion for how to try to get around some of these issues. Um, now, um, what I'm going to try to do in the next couple of slides is to motivate something that I fully accept is sort of contentious. So this is really kind of my view of what I think we should do with these cases. Um, might be many reasons to reject it, um, but I think it has some nice upshots. Um, so what I think we really ought to do at this stage is to go back and ask ourselves why we were committed to the causal exp explanatory story in the first place. Um, uh, acknowledging that this story has some nice features. We had this kind of puzzle of directionality um, where uh, causation seemed to do a really nice job of capturing the direction of explanation and seem to do a really nice job of explaining why we have this different explanatory import of temporal direction versus any other just spatial say, directions. Um, so there's some nice features to causal accounts, but um, I think that nonetheless we can do something to let go of that answer. So. The way I understand the trajectory of the discussion on scientific explanation, the deductive nominological account was rejected largely due to sort of a whole host of counterexamples, particularly troubling ones about directionality. So particularly troubling ones which just could not get directionality right. Um, causation seemed like it did such an easy job of handling these cases. Um, so, uh, so here I just um, put up a simple version of uh, Newtonian gravitation where plenty of laws have this feature but you could, you could try to rearrange them uh, but only one direction of derivation seems explanatory um, but of course you could rearrange them to do derivations in many directions uh, and famously deductive nominological accounts have a really hard time capturing these kinds of cases causal accounts seem like they do it quite easily for many cases um, so causal accounts I think have a a strong claim to ruling the day within the counts of explanation, partly because they do such a nice job of seeming to account for explanatory directionality. But here's the kind of good news part. We should have some reason to be concerned because not all expl explanations appear to be causal. Um, now, there are a few strategies we could take at this stage. We could try to argue that all explanations within some non-ad hoc domain are causal, and it's not clear that that would be very helpful for this case, so uh, here's Woodward's delineation, uh, in which roughly any explanation that proceeds by showing how an outcome depends, where the dependence in question is not logical or conceptual, on other variables or factors counts as causal. Um, now, I think for what we're concerned with here, that's actually not going to help as much because getting the kind of change that we're interested in uh, is not easily going to fit within um, uh, the causal side and it's not easily, I think, going to fit within just being logical or conceptual, so on something else. Um, we could accept a, a pluralist account of so what explanatory relations there are. Uh, I think the challenge of doing that is that you now face the standard realist challenges for why you should, um, why it's legitimate to argue from the acceptance of a style of inference in one domain with one style of explanation to another domain with another style of explanation. That question now becomes really non-trivial, uh, so I'm going to try to avoid that. Uh, and what I'm going to do instead is to try to provide a way of addressing directionality even in the familiar causal cases, 
that doesn't directly rely on causal notions. Um, now, what I will assume, and I won't argue for that here, but you can ask me more about why I think it, if you want, uh, is that explanation is a matter of showing what the phenomenon to be explained depends on some sense or other. Uh, and this is partly because I think that this is a more friendly notion for some type of realists, explanatory. Uh, uh, some realist arguments from explanatory commitment or ontological commitment than other accounts of explanation. So, for example, if we take a kind of through and through pragmatist account, it looks like that style of argument is just off the table from the start. Or if we take a highly kind of subjectivist one in terms of organizing information, we get a similar um, kind of worry. So, let me say a little bit about how I think we can do this. Now, I've already highlighted that I think that explanatory directionality, so the failure of symmetry in at least some cases of explanation, where we have um, the explanandum being explained by some explanands but not vice versa, uh, is a real problem for the deductive nomological account. Um, but I don't think that we have reason to think from that that it's a problem for any non-causal account. So really what we have is just a ruling out one particular account. Um, and here is my positive suggestion for today that I'm going to make use of, that the direction of explanation, both in causal and non-causal cases, comes partly from understanding the conditions of model application, I think actually it comes, a lot, it comes from understanding the sensitivity of what you're interested in explaining on the conditions of application or not. I'm going to try to convince you that in many cases of directionality, that sensitivity runs in only one direction. So understanding the theory as a whole, beyond the kind of simple application that we're doing, uh, we have reasons to think that explanation runs in one direction and not the other because we have reason to think that the model we have tells at least a partial story of how the explanandum depends on some phenomena together with other phenomena, but not vice versa, because shifting it around the explanandum remains insensitive to changes uh, in the conditions of application. That's going to be the upshot. So, um, before I can do this, um, I need to tell you what I have why I'm calling them model applications. Um, so all I really, I know that there's plenty of questions to be asked about whether or not it should be the world here, we should have a kind of prepared description of the state, there should be many layers of doing this, that's all fine, and actually I'm kind of sympathetic to that. Um, but the reason that I'm calling it applicators or models to start with is that the first step that I'm trying to take is to say that when we're thinking about um, realist arguments based on explanatory commitments. We're really interested in figuring out what it is we end up being committed to when we take something in the world to be explained by something else. So we're interested in this kind of worldly red relation here. What in the world depends on what else in the world, that's really what we want. Um, but, quite typically, what we end up doing is providing a model explanation of some kind where we think that there's some dependence in the model for how we take this model to appropriately reflect some feature of the world. There might then be plenty of kind of intra-model reasoning, where you're reasoning about what within the model depends on what within the model. Um, well, I think earlier we just had the description, we're not yet at the ontological level at all. Um, at least we have to argue to get there. Um, and we can then, of course, also think that we have constraints for how what we get from the model um, can or cannot be exported into the world. So the world being in some way depends on what the model has delivered. Um, so all that I really want to get out of this is a quick idea that the first step that I've taken that's different from the deductive nomological account is that I ex abstracted away explanation one level from just directly describing the world. So both causal accounts in the way they're sometimes talked about and the deductive nomological account uh, talk as if though what you're doing is just giving some part of the course of history. You're sort of staying at world-to-world -world relations all along. Um, so does the deductive nomological account in many ways of understanding it. You just have um, true particular facts and you have true laws 
at least taking the laws at a fairly straightforward reading, we're just staying in the world. There's no kind of detour uh, via modeling, but I think that turns out to be important to understand what's going on. Um, so what I really want you to get from this and what's going to turn out to be important is that within this picture, um, we can ask about what the relationship is like in terms of di dependence of direct directionality of dependence within the world. But we can also ask what explanatory directionality is like, and that can actually come from kind of three different sources at this stage. Um, some of them might reflect a directly world-based directionality, and some of them might not. So, second new feature I need to say something about is the idea of conditions of application. Uh, so this, I think, is slightly more intuitive. So the idea behind this is that when you're learning to give model explanations of some theory, you have to figure out how to correctly apply the theory. I mean, so in some ways, this point is really just saying uh, you can't just go to the cheating index at the back of the textbook and look up uh, what the summary of the most crucial laws are and now know how to explain things. Uh, you need to figure out how to actually apply these to systems of interest. Um, and calling them conditions of application is trying to highlight that you can get this wrong. Um, so what I have in mind is both for approximate and for statements that are not in approximate law-like generalizations not in approximate form, uh, we sometimes talk this way. So if you were trying to account for the period of a pendulum using the simple pendulum law um, and you did so for a pendulum with a very large swing and you then came back and you said look the simple pendulum law is false the appropriate thing to say is no you have not understood when it applies it's perfectly fine uh, you just misapplied it the conditions of application were not fulfilled you can't apply the simple pendulum law to just any uh, old pendulum uh, and Oops, I haven't put that up, so let me just tell you about it. We get similar uh, constraints, I think, for uh, combinations of laws. So think about, for example, when we're uh, learning to calculate um, um, motion uh, in a Newtonian system, where you have to figure out when it's appropriate to just be concerned with, say, the gravitational force as the dominant force and neglect any others. Now, if you find that you try to do that uh, and your uh, predicted motion does not match observations, uh, a really kind of sensible thing to say, for at least many of these cases, is that you might have failed to take into account um, some restriction of application, such that actually there was also um, uh, other forces present, or you weren't dealing with objects that could um, uh, appropriately be treated as far enough apart from each other such that details uh, of the interaction didn't matter or whatever the reason is that this has failed. So this is what I have in mind with conditions of application. For many of these kinds of for these statements that are used in challenging the deductive homological account, they're relying on the fact that we can rearrange terms in cases like these. Um, but once we take into account what went into modeling a system using these equations to start with, uh, we find that we can break the seeming symmetry of derivation. So, in um, the case of the uh, pendulum, for example, we have information coming through some sources that can be causal, but they do not need to be. They can be ones that come through direct, straightforward observation. Or they can be indirect through other parts of theories that have been supported that you can use to reason about what you think is going to happen in this case. Uh, or causal reasoning can be fine as well. The only claim here is that it's not essential. To find out that you would expect the period of the pendulum to be a legitimate explanandum because the period of the pendulum seems like it is sensitive to what you're explicitly invoking in your explanation. Uh, if you're using the 
simple pendulum law. So it seems like the period is sensitive, as we would expect, to, for example, the length. But the period is also generally sensitive to violations of the conditions of application of the simple pendulum law. So if the amplitude is not actually small, we expect that to have an impact on the period. Now, in the other direction, what caused problems for the deductive nomological account, you can notice that when the conditions of application are fulfilled, we can also rearrange the term to make it look as if though the length is sensitive to changes in the period, um, but the length is not sensitive when the conditions of application are violated. So when the amplitude is not small, this doesn't do anything to the length. So in fact, we have the resources to tell us already that the correct way of applying this model is to explain the period in terms of the length, but not vice versa. The reason that it seemed as if though we didn't have those resources is because we were focused purely on a kind of direct match of the model to model. In this case, thinking of the model is just involving in Woodwardian terms, the structural equations, what is the simple pendulum law, as directly telling us about what the world is like. But what actually happened is that we had to also figure out what the conditions of correctly applying that model, models are. And once we know that, we already know enough to break the symmetry that we can get a derivation within the model itself. And crucially for this talk, we can break it without directly invoking any causal reasoning. All right, so, so far what I've tried to do is to try to give an account of how you could get non-causal directionality even in the causal cases. So I try to, make, try to convince you that we can get directionality of explanation back even in the cases that are kind of canonically thought of as causal. So these are cases we've mostly have tried to solve using causal notions. Um, and I think the benefit of doing this is if we can now keep the same style of explanation throughout causal cases and non-causal cases. And that will be valuable insofar as we're no longer responsive to saying that we've shifted the goalpost when we moved from causal explanations to cases where causal explanations don't seem like they apply and so realist arguments are more suspect. Uh, so to give you just some views about some hint of why I think we can do this, um, I think that very similar accounts uh, apply and are useful for understanding non-causal explanations, including what people sometimes call distinctly mathematical explanations. Uh, so I'm using these examples because they are ones that people have used to argue for realist commitments to mathematical entities, um, because they seem explanatorily indispensable in various ways. Um, but I think we can tell a very similar story here. So for example, uh, it seems um, as if though we can explain the failure to take a round tour of the Königsberg's bridge system returning to our starting point um, in graph theoretic terms um, by noticing that such a tour is possible if and only if there are no uh, odd vertices, so no vertices with odd valence in the graph theoretic representation of the system. Um, and these cases have seemed as if though they needed some different account of directionality, partly because I made use of the if and only if there again. Uh, but I think we can get around this, and we can get around it because we know that there are two styles of sources of directionality within those models. One within the model itself, so we get one within the model itself because we know that the valences or vertices do not in general determine the graph, the graph does in general determine the uh, valences of the vertices, so we have a direction, we have a failure of symmetry already up here, uh, but we also have a failure of symmetry in a type 1. Um, direction of dependence, which is the one I've been more interested in in this talk, um, which has to do with conditions of application, where given the way that we are applying this, we make it quite clear that 
the graph does not constrain, oh sorry, the graph does not constrain the correct bridge configuration. The bridge configuration constrains the graph. Um, and there are various conditions of application that we have to have fulfilled to take that the little graph representation that I had a picture of of Koenigsberg's bridge system is an adequate one for solving the problem of tolerability. Uh, in particular, we need to make various kind of really commonsensical assumptions. That's a good graph theoretic representation of the bridge system and the possibility or impossibility of making a round tour of it. Uh, only if the bridges are possible to cross and they're the only way to traverse the system. Um, sorry, no, exactly, no swimming, no ferries, <coughs> various kinds of assumptions that went into making that an adequate representation of the system for the problem at hand. Um, and I'm guessing you might see how this is going to go um, right now. When those conditions are fulfilled, it's true that we can state uh, a nice bike conditional. We can state that it's possible to cross all bridges exactly once and return to the starting point, if and only if the graph has no vertex with an odd valence. Um, and the intuitive problem is that explanation seems to run in one direction here, but um, not the other. We wanted to say that the graph theoretic property explained the bridge system. Now, if the bridges are not solid and not the only way to cross the system, then in general the tolerability will be different. So the tolerability is sensitive to violations of those conditions. Um, if the bridges are solid, the only way <laughs> to cross the river, etc., we get the same by conditional, namely that uh, it's possible to cross all the bridges exactly once, and return to the starting point, if and only if the graph has no vertex and not valence. But if the bridges are not solid and not the only way to cross the river, uh, the valence of the vertices of the graphical representation um, are just not affected. What really happened was that a different graphical representation would have been appropriate. What we don't see is that by just figuring out what the graphical representation is based on the bridge configuration itself, uh, we would get a different result. What we really have is that it was an appropriate representation for the question we'd asked. So, what I hope to have convinced you of so far um, is that we have at least one suggestion for how we might try to have a continuity of how we capture directionality in the causal case and in the non-causal case once we really take modeling seriously and conditions of application seriously. Um, and this means that we can say something new about the old answer that I started the talk with. So we noticed this distinction between time and space when it came to explanatory directionality, namely that uh, it looks as if though explanation tends to align with temporal directions, so some predictions are explanatory, retrodictions are nearly never explanatory. Uh, here was the old answer. Retrodictions typically fail to be explanatory because explanatory directionality tracks causal directionality, causal directionality tracks temporal directionality, not spatial directionality. That's why we get the difference. Now we have a potential new answer. Retrodictions typically fail to be explanatory because explanatory directionality tracks sensitivity to conditions of application. And explananda tend to not be sensitive to changes in, so I couldn't find a good way without using future, that's why I have the conventionally future. So future from the perspective of the agent giving the explanation, conventionally future states. Uh, now, here's where we get back to the very start of the talk. Um, I do think that this provides a potential new answer. I think the worry is for whether we can set aside um, all notions, all temporal notions, apart from the uh, apart from the relational ones. So apart from relational time, is how plausible or not this answer becomes. So if we start worrying about things like irreversible time, this looks really plausible. <laughs> You think you actually have irreversible processes of some kind. They might not be fundamental, but you think that at least in some regions you have actual irreversible processes. Really good reason to think that, uh, in general, 
you would not expect the past to depend on the future because those aren't the kinds of irreversible processes that we see. Fine, but you now need those notions again. Uh, you could give a weaker answer just in terms of experiential time as well. So you could give an answer that says something like, no, this really comes from the way we treat evidence as agents. Um, we remember past states. Those are the ones that I kept fixed. They can't be too sensitive, at least, to future states without just undermining the evidence base we have all together. So we know that we just can't have things that way. Yeah, so we start going about reasoning. Um, because we could just never start getting on with empirical reasoning if what we took to be our evidence based based, based on our experiential present and past uh, was unreliable in light of future dependencies. So at least large parts of it has to be kept fixed. That would be a different type of answer. Uh, so, so far, here I haven't really tried to seriously convince you that any of those are particularly good ones. Uh, what I have tried to convince you is that to make this answer fully fleshed out in a way that's plausible. Uh, it looks like the way to make this seem really plausible is to either invoke something that really has to do with physical irreversible processes uh, or some notion of experiential time that gives us the epistemic foundation for why um, explananda uh, would not in, could not typically tend to be very sensitive to future conventional in the future from the agent's perspective states. Uh, which means that it looks as if though, if you agreed with me all the way, we're back to thinking that it, we can't quite as neatly separate out the notions of time that we need in arguing for a fundamental physics where, there, uh, where spatiotemporal features are not present at the fundamental level, but only at the emergent one. At least not if we do so via some realist strategy. So here's the kind of argument in brief. Explanatory directionality seems to follow temporal directionality, not spatial one. Causal accounts capture this really nicely together with a bunch of other puzzles of explanatory directionality. But this leads us to a new way of challenging the empirical coherence of theories that get rid of spatiotemporal notions at the fundamental level, not because they undermine the observation base, but because they un undermine the inferential reliability that we might want to make to realist commitments to those theories, so taking them to be theories of the world, actually have ontological commitments even in there, not directly observable aspects, um, particularly because this also looks not applicable to those theories. Um, and I've suggested that this might not be an insurmountable challenge. We could go back and, rev and revisit um, our explanatory accounts to keep explanationist commitments to realism uh, and not run into the problem of seeming like we're undermining the inferential resources that we're relying on and arguing for some kind of ponte commitment to our fundamental theories, even when they lack spatiotemporal features. Uh, using resources that fundamentally have spatiotemporal features eh, that now seem unreliable. Eh, but they could do so by, having, by preserving continuity and accounting for directionality, both in familiar and possibly causal cases and in non-causal cases. Eh, but I think the cost of doing so is that we're owed an answer as to why explanation seems to track temporal directionality and not spatial one. Eh, and we can give the starts of an answer but to start fleshing that out, the easiest way to see how to explain why we'd expect explananda to not be sensitive to, from the agent's perspective, conventionally future states, but to past ones, uh, seems like it evokes irreversible processes, that notion of time, uh, or uh, experiential time. Uh, both kind of notions of time that we might have hoped to avoid having to get into. Um, and that's it. So, thank you. So, I think I get that. I, I mean, I, anyway, thanks for a really nice, sort of super interesting talk, uh, really thought provoking. Um, so, I think I get the idea in abstract about how 
you're getting the um, explanatory asymmetry out of the um, yeah. your picture with the models and, and yeah. conditions yeah. of application. Yeah. Could you just? I think I just I still don't. But could you? It's really just asking you to repeat what you said. I think. But could yeah. you just explain in the case of the pendulum yeah. why we can't? Go, what goes wrong if, you, if I try to explain the, uh, the length. Uh, length in terms of the period? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is um, um, that when we give explanations, um, we once we think of explanations as involving um, a modeling step and conditions of making the model apply or not, we can ask not just what the directionality is from what in the kind of causal case we would have called the structural equations. <laughs> Uh, so obviously we can rearrange the simple pendulum law <laughs> to derive the length from the period and vice versa. Um, but when um, in the kind of warming up example I gave her, if you, if I should say I because you're less likely to do it, if I came to you and I said I've discovered a violation of the simple pendulum law, uh, here it is, we should write and show why it's a complete failure. Um, and I showed you a pendulum that had a large amplitude one of the sensible things to tell me would be that, look, it, it, just, it doesn't apply to those scenarios. You just haven't really understood uh, what this model properly applies to in the first place. Uh, and with that in place, we start to realize that the most we can really expect to get from within the model is a partial account of all the dependence relations there might be in the world out there. We shouldn't expect to have a kind of perfect matching to it. We could be giving some piece of information about what the period depends on. And we can still think that the period depends on the length because when the conditions of application are really fulfilled, we can of course use the simple pendulum law to say something very specific about how the period depends on the length. In cases where the conditions of application aren't fulfilled, we can't say something nearly as specific, but we still take ourselves to have good reason to think that the period would in general have been different from what it is when the conditions are fulfilled. So the period is sensitive to whether you really have large amplitudes or not, or whether you really have a nearly frictionless pivot to whether, whatever the kind of assumptions going into the model are. Uh, but we also have good reasons to think that the length is not sensitive to violations in those conditions. Um, in, this, in, this case, you, actually in this case, you have really simple ones because you can stop the pendulum. <laughs> you can change the period of the pendulum. You can stop it. You have simple observational reasons to think that the length does not alter in those cases. So you have, some, you have a, a model itself that seems to tell you that you would expect the length to vary with the period, but you also have conditions for when that model applies that would say that if this was a partial story of the full story about what the length depends on, you'd expect the length to at least in general be sensitive to when those conditions fail. You've given me a partial description of what it is that length depends on. But you have good reasons to think that we haven't. So it's not infallible reasons, but you have good reasons to think that we haven't. Uh, why? Well, because you can stop a pendulum and the length remains the same. You could increase the period and the length remains the same. So you have simple observational reasons for thinking that it doesn't hold. And um, so let, let me see, do you want me to do one where we have more theoretical reasons rather than simple observational ones? So, so those reasons seem different from the conditions of applicability reasons, though, right? Ah. So, um, so I actually think that they are, so the reasons themselves are different from condition, the reasons itself, reasons itself for thinking that the counterfactual uh, fails are different reasons from what the conditions of application are. So really what the difference in sensitivity comes to is a difference in whether or not we generally expect the counterfactual to be true. Had the conditions of application failed, then the explanandum would have been different from what it actually is. And in the case of the period, we do have reason to think that that's true. In the case of the length, we have reasons to think that it's not true, because we know scenarios when the conditions of application fail and the length is not different. Of course, we can come up with kind of conspiratorial ways in which the world might be. That means that we're misled about this. So it's not meant to be an infallible reason. We have all the general worries about how to evaluate those counterfactuals. Um, but we also have at least um, sort of garden variety reasons for thinking that uh, those counterfactuals are not true. So we have good reasons for thinking just from observation that it's false that had the amplitude not been small, then the length would have been different. So what we're really getting 
is the sense where when we take into account the conditions of applic applicability of the model we're using, we're finding a difference in sensitivity to the violations of those conditions for what we take to be the proper explanandum and what we take to be the sort of non-proper direction of explanation. Um, and I think that what that really tells us is that in the proper direction of explanation, we can think of the model as at least a partial story of information about what the dependencies are like. And we have reasons to think that we don't have that in the other direction. Yeah. Do you take yourself to have been talking about inferential reliability rather than the observational base? Um, yes. So what I think that this work, what I think the new problem raises um, is a worry whether or not we have reason to carry the realist commitments from um, causal explanatory inferences to realist commitments over to a case where we no longer have those explanatory commitments. That's why I think it raises a potential worry about the uh, argumentative strategy that you might take as a realist. And it's not, it's not undermining the observational basis that it's not the problem of um, uh, saying that the theory undermines the evidence that it relies on in a kind of straightforward sense. There just aren't any kind of spatiotemporal <laughs> localized observations yeah. that we can make. Not that worry. It's the worry that rather says, no, the worry is uh, whether or not from that observation base we have good reasons to think that we can infer to ontological commitments. Um, and they look as if though they are at least seriously damaged, let's put it that way, uh, in the case where you moved away from what you were extrapolating realist commitments to to start with in the kind of explanatory realist project. So okay, so there's something like... If I, um, you know, if I start off with Tom Garden scientific realism mm -hmm. and then on my down the road I find myself to believe in fundamental theory uh, yeah. in which time doesn't appear, yeah. you're trying to supply um, the, the inferences which, which would support that path to the um, fundamental theory without really saying anything about what evidence I might have for the fundamental theory. Exactly. The inferences that you were basing them on insofar as they were based on uh, a kind of most common, I think, scientific, uh, a counter scientific explanation in causal ones. Um, looks as if though it has you know, undermined uh, the theory of explanation that you use to convince yourself to take the theory as a fundamental physical theory of the world <laughs> to start with. That's the worry. That's why it's. But, but you don't expect us to have these sort of modeling. Um, stories to tell in addition to that application with theories of quantum gravity? Um, I would love it, but no. <laughs> so if, if, if I did, I would be much more excited than I am. Uh, um, really, really so far, but um, um, this was... So in terms for the philosophy of quantum gravity, really what this was trying to push uh, was that it's not clear to me that we have enough of what we need uh, once we have something that can talk about uh, something that can act as a time variable within the theory itself uh, it seems like we actually potentially if we want to make the realist inferences um, and to make um, that easy for us by having commonality with the garden variety realist cases uh, need both an account of explanation that captures directionality in the same way across those and explains the difference in explanation in the way it reacts with temporal directionality and spatial directionality. And it looks like you could do that, there are really tempting things to say, but they all look like they require also an account of something like irreversible processes uh, or experiential time. The kinds of things where we might have hoped that theories that don't take spatiotemporal features to be fundamental are in no worse a position with those really hard problems than just any old physical theory that needs to say something about, and, you know, or rather the kind of, it's another part of science, difficulty not 
a difficult for specific ones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think you can look at, at the slides on, on the actual yep. uh, yeah. We can still yep. look at the target. Because I was <laughs> thinking uh, about the one when there is a citation of uh, a quote from La Yeah, yeah, the yeah. So they were, they're really worried about emergence and yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was just on top, so I don't care about what La Mene Esther has said. Okay, yeah. Just the argument was just about that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so my question is the following. Uh, so even if we uh, assume that all you have said is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, um, do you agree that? So, so uh, by that I mean that in the past philosophers are discussing whether we're to be realist about theories mm. and they're using this argument inference by explanation yeah. and the notion yeah. of the inference somewhat rely yeah. on the yeah. 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 And now we cannot do this. Yeah. Uh, so you agree that logically mm -hmm. uh, there are two options. Yeah. Either we, we say this is a problem, yeah. or we say that, well, the usual philosophical grounds to realism are stupid. And absolutely, and absolutely, yeah, yeah, completely. So, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. So, so, all of this is premised on the idea that you're the type of realist that wants to help yourself to at least some explanationist realist resources. So you're willing to help yourself at least to some idea that you're committed at least to parts of theories that are indispensable for some explanatory project, or you have some no miracles uh, intuition of um, an inference to the best explanation form in mind. Um, if you sort of want to nothing to do with any of those arguments, um, then I think what I've said should not worry you. Then you should really say, this is now even more recent to show <laughs> why we shouldn't have those kinds of realist inferences. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, suppose you've presented uh, the first part of the argument, sort of the negative argument, yeah. why worry? Yeah. Uh, and now my response is, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, but, but I'm not a realist about any theories yeah. of quantum gravity. Anybody yeah, yeah. who yeah, would yeah. be a realist about any theories of quantum gravity yeah. would be a real fool, given the very immature, underdeveloped yeah. statements. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried about that. But then it seems to me you can come back using precisely the same strategy mm -hmm. that you seem to be using, if I understand yeah. it correctly, yeah. to undermine realism about much more than space-timeless quantum theories of gravity. Yeah. In fact, you can uh, use the same strategy, uh, mutatis mutandis, which is not very much that would need yeah. to be moved, yeah. uh, to, to attack any theory which to make, uh, to use a Rovelli's distinction only has relational time or something like that, but not irreversible time and experiential time, which seems to be, at least that's a common opinion, pretty much all of contemporary fundamental physics. Yeah. The standard model of particle yeah. physics, GR, all these sort of yeah. beautiful, wonderful theories, yeah. they're usually considered um, to be time reversal invariant, uh, so you don't really have an a directionality of time there, yeah. in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they don't directly give rise to an experiential time that seems to be much richer, so maybe the argument is a little bit less direct, but you could argue that you know both of these things are already absent there. Yeah. And to the extent to which they're absent there, now you can get with the negative argument going and say, ha ha ha, well, you get the explanatory directionality now, yeah. or asymmetry, yeah. <coughs> and so on and so forth. So you can't be a realist, or at least not be an explanationist realist yeah. about any of that stuff either. So, um, so I am... Um, uh, I'm not really worried about <laughs> So I am... Um, mm -hmm. um, I have... Um, I have actually worried about um, just time symmetric laws generally. The reason I think that there's slightly, at least I think there's more wiggle room for those theories, um, is because there's no um, basic commitment to denying uh, these notions at a fundamental level. So the theory isn't immediately responsible for creating them back again. So, you, so what does fall out of my theory is that, for example, even if you have a time symmetric formulation, 
it doesn't directly follow that you're going to get time symmetric explanations because you have to ask what the conditions of applicability are. And if you're willing to say, yes, of course, I don't think these laws govern the nature of time. They don't, they don't govern time. These laws apply when there is temporal notions already in place. They don't govern time. So it's not as if they're once I fixed the past. Yeah? They govern creation of time, anything like that. It's just assume it. Um, now, that's different, I think, in this case, because here they really are supposed to, supposed to have a fundamental physical theory that is, in some sense, governing <laughs> the temporal notions. They're supposed to emerge out of it um, in a way that it's not part um, of other, even time-symmetric formulations, that that's happening. So there's more leeway there to push temporal commitments into the conditions of application. And then what you get is rather, it's still kind of surprising, but you get the consequence that you can't move straight from time-symmetric laws to time-symmetric explanations. It depends what conditions you think have to hold in order for them to mm -hmm. properly be applied. And you don't think that some analogous rules would be possible for the space-time-less theories of quantum reality? Mm -hmm. Do you sort of say, okay, okay you know, it's a little bit less direct than that, you have to do a bit more work to get uh, to the direction of explanation? Yeah. Once yeah. we understand the way we yeah. have to apply these models, maybe that goes yeah. towards your more positive character. Yeah. So I think, um, so, so I do think that something analogous is possible. I just think that you take on the commitments to say something more about the temporal notions that the theory has denied yeah. in a way that other sure. theories yeah. don't, because there's been no, at least no kind of explicit claim that these theories are governing the temporal notions. That's there. But, but that seems to be necessary work to be done anyway, to recover yeah. something like the manifest image or yeah. the manifest world. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. so, so, so I agree with that. Great things, okay. <laughs> all things that we might very well um, want. I think the reason that I think it's slightly more worrying than we might have thought if we take on general explanations of various strategies is that if we take that seriously, it seems to be the case that even, even once the theory is kind of beautifully worked out, uh, even once we have a great observational base, we face really serious anti-realist concerns for the theory, more so than we would expect for other analogous theories without doing all of this work that you might think doesn't immediately fall in the remit of fundamental physics. Like how to account, for example, for irreversible processes that seems like it's you know, it's, a, it's an interesting project, and it might fall in, in, into parts of physics, but it's not what you might expect from your fundamental physical theory, and even less of a kind of experiential notions of time. Um, yeah. that's, the, but that's the kind of concern that I'm trying to push you. Oh, okay, good. That's very helpful. Is, what would be another strategy mm -hmm. to give up an explanationist form of realism? Just say, well, yeah. I'm a realist, but you know, my basis for realism is really something very different. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't involve this sort of Yep. explanation is a strategy, so yep. I don't feel touched by any of what you say. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that's a completely fair thing to do. Uh, so you could definitely give up that strategy. Um, the reason I think that it's still a relatively costly strategy is that I think that some form of kind of no miracles intuition or explanatory indispensability arguments are the kind of standard routes to go down. Yes. Um, so I think at the least you then owe a kind of account of the new realism, so now we have some serious philosophical work that we have to do um, to kind of get back to. So it definitely can do it. And also just laying the cards on the table, um, I'm actually quite worried about explanationist realist arguments to start with, so it's not that I'm unsympathetic to the idea that there might be, because in, in other parts of my work I'm worried about whether there's indispensable use of um, explanatory use of fictions. Um, and whether that really restricts the types of realist arguments you can do. So I'm not unsympathetic to that idea, uh, but I do think that it's an additional burden. It means that the realist arguments you might want to make that this theory is in no kind of worse a position than general theorist. The it looks harder without a kind of proposal on the table for how you get back to uh, a realist commitment or something. Thank you. Uh, is there another question in Chicago? So I, I had one kind of comment, or yeah. maybe it'll work into a question by the end. Yeah. Um, so, so this idea came from uh, talking to Baptiste, and maybe he in fact suggested it. Mm -hmm. So if you're sort of imagining one of those universes where at the early, earlier part, 
kind of reach a, a region which is non-spatio-temporal or just mm. non-temporal. Yeah. You might think of that as, well, maybe that really should be thought of as occurring in time, but just that whole thing just occurs at a sort of first instant. Uh -huh. Maybe it has four dimensions or something, uh -huh. or whatever uh -huh. it is. Uh -huh. Would that kind of thing, I mean, it seems like then you might, if you took that sort of picture, you might get around these words. What do you think about that? There you go, there's a question. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's helpful. So I haven't thought about that, I have to say, first I need to see if I can say something um, interesting off the bat. So the, so you're trying to turn it into being still a theory in time you're doing. Mm. Uh, so my first kind of immediate first pass thought is that I think it's, it's not quite enough, I think, to get it in time. Uh, we'd need to make the kind of explan standard explanation story on problematic. Yeah? Um, it would need to be um, in time in a sense that, m that allowed us to think that what was doing the explanatory work uh, was something like spatiotemporally located <laughs> uh, entities. Um, and I don't immediately see how you would get that, even if you kind of compress a lot of the interesting features into a spatiotemporal instant. <laughs> Um, but, but the truth is that I, I would have to think about it more to say something more informed than that, but that would be my first pass worry about whether it would get around the problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was a, you know, this came up, we were just thinking more sort of metaphysically about what this world was like, but yeah. it seemed to be interesting in the context of your talk that maybe it also has a sort of epistemic component to thinking that way as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about it a bit, I think, to say anything more. Yeah. Sure. Informed. Thanks. Ashton? Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, so I have a really kind of broad question about your theory of explanation in general. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you brought in the relationship between models and explanatory realism. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that in historical accounts of explanatory realism, a lot of these are based on principles of efficient reason in the mm -hmm. early modern period. Um, and a lot of these same authors deal with what's apt for explanation, mm -hmm. and so some of these discussions can consider whether there can be a bottoming out or a fundamental level, or whether there can be domains that aren't related. Uh, yeah. So I wonder if, and I know that fundamentality and unification are issues that yeah. worry about in fun grammar, so I wonder if there's just anything you had to say about that. Yeah, about him. Um, 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 so, um, I have a slightly roundabout thing to say. Uh, so the slightly roundabout thing that I can say is that um, I think this is Newton's view of explanation, <laughs> but that's what I've argued in my more HPS yeah. uh, moments. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think it has historical um, precedence. Uh, but I think, interestingly, in the kind of cases I've looked at, they're also largely arising from uh, epistemic concerns. So what maybe started to get me worried, thinking in these terms, was actually trying to separate the directly um, what's epistemically more fundamental from what's metaphysically more fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of thinking of explanations as taking place at the metaphysically more fundamental level, trying to reason via a modeling scenario with principles because they are epistemically more secure as a way of trying to reason about eventually the metaphysically more uh, fundamental. Um, so. My view is clearly inspired <laughs> by historical uh, accounts, uh, um, but um, but I also have a non-standard view of Newton's theory of explanation as not being causal. Yeah. Um, so that's part, that is partly why this is coming from. So, so, well, so yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, how would you relate um, what you say about space and emergence of cosmic reality mm -hmm. with uh, space and general relativity? Because uh, already in general relativity, we could say that well, yeah. the matter field uh, uh, is um, there is a relation of ontology for dependency between the, yeah. the uh, matter field and the other. Yeah. Between the metric field and the matter field. Right, yeah, so they kind of, you have a distribution of some metric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you see that already there we have some kind of uh, non temporal causal relation yeah. obtaining between yeah. the two yeah. structures, something like this. Yeah. 
what's specific with space time emergence with respect to this kind of phototological dependency? Uh -huh. uh, with respect to your own account? Ah, yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so yes, yeah, so I have worried a bit about um, how to think about... So one of the reasons why, slightly non-standardly, I keep on talking about non-symmetry uh, is because uh, I think that explanation is directed, so I think there's a direction to each explanation that we give, uh, but I don't think that explanation um, is um, um, asymmetric or forbids mutual dependence. Um, in the way that is more common to say. Um, that's partly why I had the non-symmetric. I think there are plenty of cases of failures of symmetry in explanation. Uh, but I don't think that we have a general ban on the idea that if uh, the explanance explains the explanandum, there can't be an explanation where the explanandum explains the explanance. Uh, and one of the, uh, one of the reasons for worrying about that is what to do with cases where it looks like we have something more like a consistency constraints so you have something that uh, a legitimate um, solution or le legitimate model has to fulfill, um, but you don't really have something where you can easily dissolve that into just one direction of dependence. Um, so, yeah, but I don't think it actually really solves the problem here. And one reason why I think it doesn't solve the problem here is because there's still plenty of cases where what we have are um, if failures of symmetry, so you still have to account for directionality. And even in those cases, what I would say is just that you can get cases where explanation can run in both directions. Uh, I don't think that we should forbid that, forbid us, uh, cases where you get independence in both directions. Um, but it's still directed. You still have a direction to the explanation. It's in plenty of cases where it doesn't go both ways. So that's my general thought about what happens in these cases. So I think they look quite different. Uh, from what's happening in the case where you don't have space your temporal notions at the fundamental level. Because um, here I take it that the, the relation that you want is really one that is the fundamental theory uh, governing, giving rise to, explaining the emergent phenomena, not vice versa. Um, but I agree that there's nothing in my theory that rules out that you can ever get explanatory bidirectionality and I, because I think that you might be able to, so I don't want you to do that. Uh, and the reason for why it doesn't is that it all depends crucially on uh, what the local situations look like with the conditions of application. There's no guarantee that there's always going to be conditions of application that break symmetry. Um, and depending on your views about explanation, you might think that's a virtual or a vice, but it's intentional. This is very interesting, but it seems to me that, that maybe explanation doesn't always track dependence. Ah, okay. Because yeah. if presumably dependence or grounding or something like that is yeah. an asymmetric relation, mm -hmm. if we can have bi-directional or non-directed explanation or, or some or, or yeah. however we want to call that, yeah. then at least some of those explanations, maybe those involving constraint conditions or other yeah. things like that, they not may be tracking something else, but not yeah. dependence. Yeah, so uh, I think that's a really good suggestion. And um, I, um, I have argued that Grundy is not primitive <laughs> and asymmetric. Um, in fact, I think you can capture the kind of metaphysics cases that people use to motivate grounding in very similar ways um, to what I've just done here in terms of conditions of application that you have to take. Uh, for the legitimate rules of reasoning in your metaphysical theory to apply. Um, so I've tried to do that for the Socrates thing, for Seth Socrates, for example. Um, so I don't think that grounding should be thought of as a primitive directed notion. But you are completely right that that's, okay. that's the standard, standard view of grounding, I think, yes. is that it's a primitive, asymmetric. Um, I don't think that we have good reasons to go there from the view that people often make of looking at the cases of metaphysical explanation to postulating grounding as a relation by causation. Uh, uh, so in some ways, actually for very similar reasons okay. to what I've given. The, oh sorry. Very interesting. Then, so, so you would insist that explanation does track dependence. Yeah. It's just that this dependence is somewhat different, maybe also from what we standardly thought uh, it was. Yeah, so I, have, uh, I, think, I think it's a really good point to press me on, because I think there are plenty of problem cases. Um, so the case that I've been working on recently that um, I think you can say something about, but it gets tricky, 
um, is, for example, what to do when you have explanations that people sometimes think of as constraints from symmetry, say. Um, I actually think you can do similar things, as it turns out, for trying to capture that. Um, but I am less... Um, but it's more recent, so I'm less confident that it's going to work out. But I do think that those are the kinds of cases to push as to whether there's just like a radically different account of explanation that's needed. Um, uh, as are constraints, I think all of those are kinds of cases to push whether a radically different account of explanation is needed. Um, the reason that I'm not quite ready to give up yet is that uh, even in the kind of symmetry case, it looks to me like there's a story to be told about symmetry and conservation laws. Um, that gives us a dependence account, um, even though the first pass is not um, But I think you are, you are both right to press them. <laughs> I think there are places to try to push. Thank you. So we just have a couple more minutes. Is there any other question in Chicago? Uh, I don't think so. Thank you. Any other question in Geneva? Well, in that case, please join me in thanking Nina again.